This is a show designed for primarily young people or youth, basically 13 to 21, so, such kind of that range, um, that tries to give them the truth where the world lacks the truth, um, where the world says truth is subjective and morality is subjective. This tries to give God's truth from scripture. You do an excellent job of connecting with the students and the way you present is just exceptional. For the Christian homeschool family to watch because these ideas of people saying truth doesn't exist, that's not some foreign out there outside the walls. Like, no, that is, that's our world right now. I think this course is a really good course for parents too, because it does give us that awareness of this is what their peers are believing. People, when they answer those questions, like when I say it's two plus two, can that be six? When they say, yeah, I guess it could be for you. They're not lying. They're telling the truth. Yeah. And they're going to be the people that are going to be your kids' teachers and um, are going to be your grandkids' little league coaches. Like that's, that's the world now. Hey everybody, this is Randy, the Vice President of Marketing with Newly Publishing Group and Master Books. And I am here today with John Fabares. He is the host of Road Trip to Truth. Uh, it's a new course in the masterbooksacademy.com. And uh, it's a course that seeks to teach us the truth about some of life's biggest questions uh, regarding the existence of God, the gospel, uh, evolution, the reliability, and even truth itself, which is becoming a bigger issue all the time. Um, so thank you, John, for joining me. I appreciate it. And totally. I look forward to, to discussing this course with you and getting a little bit more information. So um, as the host of this series, how do you describe Road Trip to Truth? How would you, what's your elevator pitch, so to speak? Yeah, yeah. The, the 30 second elevator pitch would probably be this is a show designed for primarily young people or youth, basically 13 to 21, so, such kind of that range, um, that tries to give them the truth where the world lacks the truth, um, where the world says truth is subjective and morality is subjective. This tries to give God's truth from scripture, which is why so much of the, the topics that we cover are straight from the scriptures and the, um, the problems that we're tackling, we, we find answers in the scripture because um, God speaks to these issues. God speaks to um, whether or not we're created by him or not. God speaks to morality. God speaks to, we have even an episode about Easter. We have an episode about anxiety and depression. God speaks to those things. And a lot of those things the world is already talking about, some of those at least, not all of them. Um, but God speaks to those. So we want to give um, people who are growing up today God's truth on those issues. That's the kind of the elevator speech. Okay. How, how did you, how did the series come to be? And how did you end up hosting the series? Yeah, really, there's two people behind this show. Um, one of them is Todd Friel, um, which you guys probably know if you know anything about the show. But the other one is named Tom Hammond. And Tom Hammond wrote a, a book called um, What Time is Purple? And the subtitle has the, the phrase Road Trip to Truth in it. And really, I think this was kind of a Tom and Todd getting together their idea to do a show um, specifically for young people. And because neither one of them fit the demographic of the host, which I'm sure um, they would have done a great job. But they went outside and they found me. Um, my, my dad is a pastor here, um, relatively well-known pastor. Um, he runs uh, Compass Bible Church and Focal Point Ministries. Uh, Mike Favares is his name. And Todd knew my dad. And so they got talking and then Todd interviewed me and it was an interview a lot like this. And I got grilled for a long time. <laughs> um, and he even had some of his uh, wretched workers in there um, grilling me, pretending to be the college student, giving me these, you know, the horrible comebacks and insulting me and whatever it was, it, but it was fun. And um, <laughs> after that we got connected and that was the beginning of 2019. So um, ultimately I think this project is kind of the, the child project of uh, Todd and Tom getting together and wanting to shoot a show um, primarily for a, a younger audience about the truth. Well, kudos to them because I think you do an excellent job of um, 
connecting with the students and the way you present is just exceptional. We, we're really drawn to the course and I look forward to our families being able to take the course because I think um, students are going to be very open to the way that you, you are, uh, you know, there's a certain um, demeanor that I notice you have to have when you approach somebody and humility and, and you just did a, an exceptional job of that. So kudos on that. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. It's definitely harder to talk them than talk about them right and um having to talk to them you can't be a jerk because if you are you lose the conversation immediately so it's interesting how um that kind of progressed as it went along and some of the shots that we probably see are me later on um the first couple of days was you know trying to figure it out because it's, it's nothing that i've ever really done before at least with a camera um, yeah but yeah it was it was a, it was a cool experience Wow. How many, like how many campuses did you attend and, and how massive was the project? It was a big project. I, I, so I live in Southern California. I work here in Orange County. Um, I'm a youth pastor myself here. Um, but we, no, not we, me, just me. Um, I flew out uh, 10 times to the Atlanta area over the course of about a year and a half. Wow. So, it was a big project, yeah. So I'd, I'd leave um, early, early on Monday morning, and I would fly back late on Thursday or late on Friday. Um, so I missed a lot of weeks, but it was it was good because what we did was we shot on campus stuff, and then we shot stand up stuff. So whenever I'm talking to camera, um, that was all filmed in, in a span of a couple of weeks. But me on campus, that took um, something like six weeks. So. Yeah. Wow. Was it different culturally? Like, was there, it was a bit of a culture shock going to Georgia and, and interviewing campuses there? A little bit. And yeah, this is something that um, I think is just really interesting. The university culture was actually more similar to my culture than the university culture was to the surrounding areas culture, um, if that makes any sense. Okay. So it sounded like I was talking in California on the campus because that's the a lot of the positions and the views that they had. That sounds like going, you know, to the to the mall here and doing street evangelism, same kinds of things. Um, but it was interesting talking to the people who you know work for Wretched. That kind of um, that, those kind of responses were more unusual for Bible Belt people, so to speak. So, but I was surprised actually how many real Christians we talked to um, when we asked them what the gospel was. We had probably over the court, we talked about 200 students for season one, and I think we had about seven, eight, ten maybe who shared the gospel with us, which was great. I mean, a lot higher than I would have expected, a lot higher than a California campus, I think, personally. Yeah. So that was awesome. Oh, that's neat. That's neat to know. Well, how important of an issue do you feel truth is to this generation? Yeah, it's so important because, uh, like, it's a, if you think about truth as an idea, like, it's so foundational to anything else you believe. Because it's like the foundation. You take the foundation out, the house doesn't stand. Um, you could talk to your student about anything. You could talk to them about morality. You could talk to them about even re the idea of revelation. I was just preaching on that yesterday, right? The idea of revelation that um, God speaks. Okay. So if there's no such thing as truth, God speaks. As the Bible reveals it, all that means is I think that God might have said something at some point, And this is people's best interpretation of what God might have said, right? That's a lot different than God spoke and here's what he said. And when you take out truth as a foundation, anything else you teach that is anywhere near uh, Christian doctrine, it, it just doesn't even work. So it's, a, it's such a worldview shift. And I think um, the reason this is important and we want to solidify is because I think a lot of Christians will watch this. Um, so one of the demographics we shot for was the non-Christian, really. We hope this to be evangelistic, that a non-Christian would watch this they would have their presuppositions and their ideas. They would have them all challenged. And maybe they'd come away um, hearing the gospel and, and finding a church and getting saved and, and everything like that. But this is also for the Christian homeschool family to watch because these ideas of people saying truth doesn't exist, that's not some foreign out there outside the walls. Like, no, that is, that's our world right now. That's your country right now. That's your state right now. That's your city. I mean, that's your community. That's what they believe. Um, and, you know, especially for, for families that are, are trying to train their kids up, that's why this is important, because if they're going to get a job anywhere, it could be at McDonald's, it could be at Chick-fil-A, it could be at a, you know, huge corporation, wherever they go, they're going to have people that believe the, um, you know, we might call them crazy, but the crazy idea that truth doesn't exist. So if you want your student to grow up and 
be trained in the Lord. This is just one of our generational challenges that we're going to have to um, train our, our kids on. Yeah, I, well, I have nine kids. We've launched five. We have four still at home. And, you know, they're fairly sheltered. They grew up. I had pastored. We're in a Christian business. So they, they're fairly sheltered. But I'm always amazed at how it still culture seeps into their worldview. And every now and then you just get blindsided by, well, where did you develop that worldview? Because that's not that's not really what we believe. And I think this course is a really good course for parents, too, because it does give us that awareness of this is what their peers are believing, talking and then and then having the conversation uh, beyond that. What would you recommend to parents um, as far as, because I know in youth ministry, same thing, you, you see the side of kids that's different sometimes than what parents do. What do you recommend for a parent as far as this conversation? Because I think teaching truth and holding to truth and even having something that you're willing to sacrifice for in truth is so valuable. What would you recommend to parents um, in regards to teaching their children the value of truth, especially in an age of, of, you know, relative truth. Yeah. Well, the value is um, just kind of like the book of Proverbs says, if you train up a child in the way he should go, he's not going to depart from it when he gets old. Right. So um, if you shape worldview as a young person and that worldview is consistent enough for them to apply to all the areas of their life, um, then they're, I think they're going to keep it, right? Especially when you add the spiritual element is if they repent of their sins and trust in Christ, God's holding them, right? They're, they're, they're saved people if that happens. Um, but, but even before they get saved, even before they trust in Christ for their own salvation, um, you can still develop that worldview because if you think about it, um, you're getting them to think through issues. Everyone has a worldview. Um, how come a lot of other people's worldview stands the test of time? Well, it's because maybe it fits in better with what the culture says. Well, you have the right worldview. You're, I mean, if you're teaching your, your kids the Christian worldview, the biblical worldview, you have the correct worldview. So it will stand the test of time. But part of what we need to do is be more comprehensive with what we, we teach our, our students, our kids more specifically. Right? I, you know, My perspective is seeing them as students. Um, your perspective as a parent is seeing them as your kids. Um, if we can cover more of the issues so they're not blindsided by things. Um, it's one of the kind of philosophies that um, my dad always had when I was young, because I went to public school for most of my life, uh, homeschooled a little bit at the beginning because my mom was a teacher, but then we were in public school basically from second grade on. Um, he would often talk to us beforehand about the things we might learn. Like I remember in first or second grade, he's always asking about evolution. I'm like, I've never heard that word before. I don't know what that is. He's like, no, no, trust me. You're gonna, you're gonna hear about it. And, and this is what it's all about. This is what they're gonna say. And then sure enough, in about third or fourth grade, getting taught evolution, like I know about this. I know that, you know, this is wrong about it and this isn't true, right? And I was a little, I was self-conscious enough to keep my mouth shut at the time. It wasn't like going off telling the teacher, but still it was helpful for me because I knew ahead of time what I was going to hear. And then once I started to hear it, I could pick up even before, you, you know, even before it came in all of its fullness, I could hear them starting to talk about in that situation, you know, millions and millions of years. And I could hear, oh, they're going to talk about evolution now. Um, so I already knew it was coming before it came. So I think that's kind of, I know that's a small example, but that's a helpful paradigm, I think, for the idea of training our, our, our kids. Um, let them know ahead of time. Same thing with sexual issues, especially with gen. I mean, gender now is such a young person. Like that has been brought down in curriculum so young um, that I feel like you can't avoid talking about that. Um, even with young kids, at least just talking about it at an age appropriate level. Um, you know, God made you a boy. God made you a girl. Um, and you are you can't be either one like that. You could teach that to a two year old. Right. So that, that's age appropriate. So but just uh, preparing them for what they're going to hear ahead of time. That's the main principle. So if you think they're going to hear about sexuality issues, you think they're going to hear about truth issues, tell them that beforehand. But but I think that puts a pressure on the parent to know what's going to be said, which I think is exactly goes back to why you said, I think this, this curriculum is good, not just for um, parents to teach their students and have the students benefit. But if you're a parent, I mean, l listen to the videos, listen to what these students say, because um, these students are... Um, they're real people. We did not hire any actors. I'm I am the only actor. <laughs> not really an actor, but um, yeah, these people when they answer those questions, like when I say it's two plus two, can that be six? When they say yeah, I guess it could be for you. They're not lying. They're telling the truth. 
Yeah. And they're going to be the people that are going to be your kids' teachers and um, are going to be your grandkids' little league coaches. Like that's that's the world now. So I just think parents in general, what we can do to maybe do a better job of training is to get to really wake up to the fact that that's what the world teaches and also uh, to be willing to prepare your kids before they hear it, which is uncomfortable a little bit, can be uncomfortable for us uh, as the parent, but I think it's necessary. Now, one of my favorite stories when I was a young parent that I came across was a very influential political family. The father, what he would do is take newspapers, he would cut out different articles and he put it on the dinner table at night. And then everyone, you know, the children would pick it up and read it. And then from that, he would shape their worldview by addressing current situations. And um, all of the, they've been very influential in, in what they've done politically and their worldview was all shaped right there at the, at the dinner table. So yeah, cool. it's really neat. In episode 12, you talk about anxiety and depression. And um, we had mentioned a little bit about how even the tone of that episode is a little bit different. Why, why did you decide to include an episode on that in a series on truth? Yeah, well, I think the main reason is because it's a problem that is really related to truth. It really is related. I know it's one step removed perhaps, but it is related to truth because um, one of the reasons that it seems like, uh, for example, wh why today in the non-Christian world, let's just say, let's go outside of the church, let's just go say our non-Christian culture in America. Um, why are young people, as in 13 to 21, why are they killing themselves at such a high rate? Why is suicide increased? Okay. Um, well, I think one of the reasons is because you've stepped away from God's pattern of truth. You've stepped away from God's morality. You've stepped away from God's rules. You've stepped away from, you know, even a culture that at least pleases God a little bit more. Um, you, you're stepping further and further away into sin. What happens when you step further and further away into sin? Like Romans 1 says, right? God gives you over to your sin and gives you the consequences of those sin. And I think anxiety and depression culturally at least is one of the the consequences of rejecting what god says so um it's important for truth in that way but also we included it just because it is so common among the people that at least i i talked to here in southern california i assume um all throughout the country in youth groups especially for girls right but even increasingly so now for guys too um it's like heightened insecurities and um, one example we always give is they're always, you know, they've got the, they're looking in a mirror the whole time. They're always concerned about themselves. It's like, Hey, how about you stop worrying about yourself? Let's look to Christ. Let's look to serving others and cures a lot of, um, the anxious feelings that we have. I know not for everybody, not all at once, but, um, you know, we just think it's important. And uh, you mentioned the difference in tone there. Um, the tone difference is mainly because when we talk about truth, it, even for me personally, I can, you know, teach a class or whatever, and I've got a certain tone, but if I'm talking to someone individually who's hurting, um, this is different, right? You know, the preacher voice is different than the counselor voice. You might say the same things, but you say them in a different way um, because the, the context requires that. So th this episode, the context in, in our minds as we shot it was at least this, that um, we've got people who are depressed, people on the verge of suicide who are gonna watch this and if that's the case, how do they need to be approached? What do they need to hear? And um, obviously covering a lot of different topics in that episode, but that was the, the main tonal difference there. Okay. Well, I know from homeschooling and serving thousands of homeschool families over the years that um, sometimes the emotional issues that homeschoolers feel associated, like if I'm going to a public education system, I'm going to encounter bullying, I'm gonna encounter worldviews much sooner, I'm going to encounter guy-girl relationships and, and temptations and all of that much sooner than I am usually in a homeschool family. But the same emotions, the same trials, the same feelings, eventually they have to face. And so where my kids might have faced it at 13, 14, or 15 in a public school setting, now they're facing it at 21, 22, and 23. They have a little bit more grounding. They're a little more solid. They have, you know, they're not, they don't have all the insecurities of being an early teen. But I still think that it's important that there's a grasp on placing your security and hope in the right things. And um, I really appreciated that that was part of the series and the way that you did it, I thought was very personal and, and there was hope in it. So uh, cool. I thought you did a really good job with that. Well, cool. thanks. 
what is there one episode that really stood out for you as being one of your favorite or part of it? Uh, it's hard. Um, I, I really did like the first couple that just talked about truth. Maybe it's just because I've seen them the most. Um, <laughs> I see those clips posted the most. Um, yeah, I, I think that was a good intro to the series. And if you haven't watched any of it, those are kind of the important ones to watch. Um, yeah, the 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 other one, I, I hate to say this, but I'm getting some of the, the episodes confused because we actually shot season two. And um, I'm <laughs> picturing some of those episodes and I'm trying to distinguish the two. Um, but yeah, I think the the ones about hope and anxiety is super helpful. I really think that um, if your students have ever mentioned that to you before, or um, if even that they talk about those problems with other people, because you know sometimes your kids will bring up problems that such and such has, and it's really problems they're thinking about too. Um, they just kind of hide behind their friend or whatever. Um, but yeah, that's a great one to show them. But the, the truth ones at the beginning are interesting because uh, that can really give you a hunger for studying. Uh, what really the, the course is meant to, to, to display for students to study. Yeah, I know that's awesome. Well, thank you. And I've been in past or in, uh, in closing, what was one thing that, that maybe you like were surprised by or kind of that one thing that you didn't expect to encounter in the series? Uh, was there anything that stood out? Yeah, a couple things stood out. I don't think they were like brand new ideas, but the idea that people really believe this stuff, right? Two plus two could equal six, right? That's hard. like, if you really sit there and think about it, like that's hard to wrap your mind around. How how can you really think that? And the the contradictory, the, or the contradictions in people's worldview, that was amazing. And it was really cool because all you could start to do is just ask some questions. You just sort a couple of those things out real quick. Say, oh, you do think that, okay, so everything is objective, right? What about morality, you know, murder, uh, rape, incest, are, are, can those things be good? Oh, well, no, those can't be good. Oh, well, why not? Oh, well, I guess I do believe some things are actually, okay, well, great. Um, then you can go back to saying two plus two equals four, right? We can, we can agree. You're kind of just joking with, and like, yeah, I know it's really four, but like, I know I'm supposed to say it could be six. Um, which is the other thing I think, um, with these worldviews, it's like people, especially college students, they know that what they're supposed to believe, but then there's what they actually believe and there's a difference there too. So for a lot of those students who who know they should be, you know, in the common terms, like woke, they should be woke about things, but they're like, oh, I don't really know if I really believe that truth, all truth is relative. Like that seems like a stretch for me. Um, those people are out there. And that opened my eyes that there's um, people who want to claim to be, um, you know, on the right side of history or whatever, um, who really have a hard time believing um, some of the falsehoods of the the no truth mentality. So that was cool. Also, just seeing um, a lot of college students want to change their mind, right? And that was surprising to me. Uh, I just thought most people would double down. And that's, we always joked about it, the crew and, and me, um, everybody had a tactic. There's one of two tactics. They're either going to listen to our questions and engage with us, and they're going to change their mind, or they're going to double down. And sometimes you, if you watch the show, you see people double down and just look foolish, right? And they know it. They know two plus two is not equal six, but because they want to be consistent with what they said, they'll double down on saying the wrong thing, and it makes them look foolish. Which you know, not obviously not the intention, but it is interesting to see how when some people got honest, they were willing to change their mind. And I think uh, that as we do evangelism, uh, not just in the home, but also like in, in your local church, you're going to have people that come in who are 20 sums, 30 sums, who might think like the people that you're watching in the show. And um, a lot of them will be willing to change their mind if you talk to them. So um, I think that's an extra push just for everybody. Um, if you can build some relationships with the new people that wander into your church, um, that would be awesome because I think a lot of them are, are right there and they want to know the truth. And um, sometimes it will just take a good relationship with a solid Christian who can answer their questions and, and uh, really lead them to Christ for salvation. So um, yes, that is one big thing that people are willing to change their mind. Yeah. I think in a culture, I know because of the ages of my kids, one thing my son has said to me um, repeatedly is, you know, you pretty much fought all of our battles. You were on the bull, you were, you were defending us on the playground. You were, you know, like 
you made all of the decisions for us. You didn't want us to get hurt. So you, you took the pain for us type thing. But because of that, we're not really good at navigating things. So we're looking for leadership. That's why Amazon reviews are so valuable because they tell us, oh, the masses have said this is a good product so I can trust it. Mm -hmm. uh, and and in, I, I've noticed with my kids, especially, they're just looking for strong leaders who say, this is what to believe. This is the way we're going and I'm confident in it. And when they find somebody, um, it's, it was fun in the videos. There was one gentleman in particular that you were questioning and you were talking about um, the Nazis and, and if it's okay to murder all these Jews. And, and he started at one position and you could just tell he was, he was collapsing very quickly. And then he was willing to follow you basically because you know, you had, you had proven yourself trustworthy to follow. So I think it was, it was, it was, all the illustrations you used were amazing. The interviews were, were fun to watch. And I think families are gonna get a lot out of the takeaways and um, the interviews that you do with leaders and Christian leaders, um, as well as students. There's just so much good information. This course is dripping with information. So, well, thank you, John. I appreciate you joining me and, and I appreciate your involvement in this course. I think um, uh, we need it. And so it's valuable. And uh, thank you for your time today. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. See you later.